Broadcasting Australian Livestock Future webinar series featuring guest presenter Simon Quilty. We would like to pay our respects, acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional custodians of the land, rivers and seas. We acknowledge and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging of all nations. I'm one of your hosts this evening, Max Newsom, Livestock Officer at the Northern Tablelands LLS and back again, our other host from the North Coast, LLS, Nathan Jennings. Welcome, Nathan. Good evening, Max, and welcome back to everyone who joined us last week. Yeah, it was great to see so many people joining us for part one with well over 400 registered and similar numbers again tonight. Last week, we Simon built a picture of the different factors impacting the red meat industry, and I'm like all of you, keen to see what he has to say tonight. Before I hand it over to you, Nathan, to take us through the housekeeping, a warm welcome to Simon. Yeah, no, I'm with you, Nathan and uh, and Max, so it's good to be here this evening. I'll now hand over to Simon, as I'm sure everyone is very interested in hearing what you've got to say. Over to you, Simon. Great. Many thanks um, once again, uh, Nathan and Max, and uh, to be back with you all again this week. Um, so first of all, um, we will be recapping some of the um, the matters that we touched on last week, but I'm going to try and incorporate those into the individual forecasts themselves. So, just to um, uh, highlight some of the um, the key areas, and, and in particular, we've had some recent figures by the USDA, which are absolutely significant, um, and these effectively give us a clear guidance on what's going to happen to the issue they've got with the backlogging of cattle in their system. And so as we showed you last week, there'd been some dramatic falls in cattle slaughterings and hog slaughterings in America due to COVID-19. We saw them get as low as 40% of their total production was stopped. And as a result, cattle prices fell 20% or more in America. And we've, we've seen um, retail prices skyrocket in America as a result. So the net effect of that is that those cattle that should have been slaughtered have been held back. And we'll be discussing what that impact will be because that has changed, I think, the global markets. So once again, COVID-19 plays a critical role and we'll discuss the Aussie dollar. So. We finished last week with touching on um, the forecast that we'd, uh, we'd spoken of last week, and I wanted just to um, bring them back to your attention. So um, this was back in November 2018, so 16, 17 months ago, we were making some outrageous uh, forecasts. I put a high of $8 uh, a kilo. I actually think that that now is likely to be close to 8, 850 on the EYCI, the Eastern Young Cattle Indicator. And we predicted a February, March 2021 high. I'm actually now going to be bringing that high forward and we'll be bringing that into the months of October and November this year. And why is that? It is because of that displacement of cattle in the system in North America. And we are talking now, and close to about one and a half million head of cattle have been pushed back through the system. Um, so that's been dramatic in terms of how the market can cope with that. And so um, as a result, it's created a hole in the, um, in the marketplace that I think will become very obvious during um, the months of September, October, November. Um, and it will create problems for the first quarter. So 800 was my thought. I'm telling you now that I think we're going to go much higher than that um, this year. And I was you know, originally hoping if we hadn't have had that dramatic impact of COVID-19 in America, I would have actually have stuck to my forecast here of February, March next year. But in actual fact, it's created a new market, a new environment, so let's let's discuss it. So 
let's not forget quickly our thoughts on where the drought stands because we need to put a stake in the ground and have, I think, a, a good view of this because that helps drive a lot of the pricing of our cattle. If we were to suddenly fall back into drought again, then it would be a different story. But as we explained last week, we looked at 120 years of data and in that data, we've seen history repeat itself. So nine extreme dries were compared to what we're up against today. And lo and behold, the drought broke after every extreme dry over the last 120 years. And 2019 was the driest of all of them. So year one, we're into it. Um, and I'm firmly the opinion that we'll see year two next year, 2020, as a wet year. So effectively on the eastern seaboard, the drought is broken. It isn't the case though in Western Australia. So it's important because as we go forward, our forecasts for next year are relying upon good conditions. And I'm confident um, in saying that this is the reason why I think good conditions will prevail, that history has shown that it, it can and will occur. So let's focus on how extraordinary this drought has been. And what you've got in front of you here are the three previous droughts and what we did in terms of um, killing females in, in, in our cattle herd. It is by far the best indicator of the severity of a drought because inevitably we're kill, killing our breeding stock, which is the last thing we want to do in you know, really dry conditions. And as I've re related to before, in actual fact, I think this also gives us an important window into what's going on in, in the sheep area in the flock because the statistics simply don't tell us the number of females that are killed um, in, in the um, sheep meat data. It, it just uh, collectively puts ewes and weathers together. So it will show you later on, but there is a strong, I think, relationship between the, the building and the liquidation of the flock and along with the cattle herd. So it gives us an important window into understanding what's going on. But never before have we killed the females at such a rate for 11 months. So the dotted black line is where is the point of equilibrium. So below the dotted black line, we start to rebuild. Above it, we're liquidating. And even as of January, we were liquidating our stock all the way through, I believe, to February, March. And I think it's finally in late March and April that the rebuild started to really commence with earnest. So that just gives you an amazing insight because, as I said, you compare that to the three previous droughts, 2002 and 3, 2014 and 15, and 2009 and 10, and this female kill is way beyond anything else we've ever seen before. It also tells us that we've been killing a truckload of males as well because they've, we've kept up with them at the same rate. And I think today in the feeder steer market, that's exactly what we're seeing. We thought there might have been a lull, a buy opportunity present itself over the next four or five, six weeks, but that's not the case. No matter how many disturbances or unknowns that could disrupt the market, there just simply isn't the cattle out there. And I think this particular graph highlights it more than anything else, just how we've depleted our herd, both of females and males. So here's a, a quick um, assessment of what that impact of high slaughterings has been. So these are my estimates that I'm of the opinion that we have seen the cattle herd fall to around about 24 million by the mid by June this year, um, and that's from a high back in 2018 of 28 million. The slaughterings have been last year at about 8.4 million, um, and this year is expected to drop to about 6.6 .6 million, and next year 
6.57 million. Well, very, very similar this year and next. But there's a fundamental difference between the slaughterings this year and the slaughterings next year. This year's slaughterings, the animal that will be the hardest to find in terms of the dramatic impact will be males. So during 2020, they will be in very short supply. And in 2021, they'll start to rebuild and, and pick up again in terms of numbers. When you look at the female kill, though, this year, once again, will be very low, don't get me wrong. But next year, in 2021, will be the absolute low female kills. So there's always this delayed effect that you see after um, a liquidation, a drought, and then a rebuild that the steers are the lowest in the, to begin with, and then that's followed by, a year later, the females. And I, this year, this, this is no exception, this drought um, and the rebuild and, uh, and coming out of the drought. So currency and its role. It's really important that we watch currency, and with all the talk of high unemployment versus the Aussie dollar, um, it's really critical that we keep in mind what could happen with the currency. Now, I am no um, uh, forecaster of currency and would be very reluctant to do so, but I do want to highlight a couple of important things here. And one is that you know we had the latest unemployment figures this week of 6.2 percent up. 5.2%. But what's important to note is that these figures are grossly understated. And why, is, why do we know that? It's because 594,000 people left employment the previous month and only 104,000 applied for benefits, um, and which requires therefore applying for jobs. So effectively we've had you know, almost um, uh, 500,000 people who are simply just not looking for work have given up on that thought process, let alone all the other workers or previous workers out there prior to this month that are in the same boat. So in actual fact, the belief is that these figures should be closer to around 9.5% right now unemployment. And I think as time goes on over the next 12 months, those figures will be worn out. And so why is that important? And, and the, sorry, the other key thing to talk about is underemployment, 13.7%. So effectively, they're people that have got jobs but are just making ends meet. And they're often you know, doing part-time work, which is effectively what it is, but they're not earning enough. They're li living from paycheck to paycheck. And that affects desperately how people spend and their consumer buying power, etc. So we have got um, 1.3 million on Job Seeker, and we have 6 million workers on Job Keeper right now in Australia. These are significant numbers, and that finishes on September 27th. And when that finishes. The belief is that we will still have very high unemployment numbers because some employers may not take back all those workers after the JobKeeper scheme finishes. So we touched on this the last time. It was all about um, where we sit in terms of currency. And what I'm about to show you is um, that Australia, um, during high levels of unemployment, how was it the currency has fallen the last five times or four times it's happened. So just a refresher though, the lower we sit on that table, the more competitive we are. And to remind you that our South American friends are incredibly competitive with the real down 41%, the peso Argentinian down 70%. And combined, those South American countries make up 78%. China's beef imports. We only supply 11%. So it's really important currency and how we fit in. So 
here I've given you a quick snapshot of the five, four or five last previous unemployment periods. And in each case, we had the Aussie dollar fall. So I took a very conservative look at it and said, if we were to fall in any of the ranges that we had seen since the last time we had figures like these, and if we do get to around 10 to, 10 to 11 to 12 percent unemployment, then the chances are we're going to see an currency probably get into the mid um, 55s. Today we sit around about 64 and a half, 65 um, on the Aussie dollar. So mid 50s, it does have a huge impact on our pricing. Okay, so let's move forward. Kicking the can down the road. So what does that mean when I say we're kicking the can down the road? That is you're delaying or pushing back a problem. And that is you're trying to actually not deal with it today for whatever reason it is. And the problem is being pushed for later on over the next few months. And that's exactly what's going on when we look at the US beef production. As I stated at the start, people are struggling to get their cattle killed into feedlots to begin with and then actually killed. And that is because of COVID-19, because of the sickness and because they've been only operating at around 35 to 40% less in capacity, which has meant cattle have backed up to the equivalent of about 1.5 million head, just simply has not gone to slaughter over the last two months. And that number is building as the production system continues to struggle. Now I'd like to add that this week things have slightly improved and those percentage figures have come down a little bit more, but it's still resulting in cattle backing up. So WASDA, which is a part of the USDA, came out with a report last week saying that they've altered their figures and that we're likely now for this year to have 5.5% less production than last year. Up until now, we were expecting production this year to be more than last year. So they've rearranged their figures and effectively they've kicked the can down the road. They've basically said those 1.5 to 1.6 million head of cattle are now going to be slaughtered next year. And that's now made next year's production up 6.7%. And whenever that happens in America, it has a significant impact on pricing. And that is the heart of a lot of our discussion tonight, is that impact on pricing. And the issue is, how far have they kicked that can down the road? So what I'd like just to touch on briefly is also pork production, which has seen the similar thing happen. A lot of hogs can't be killed, so that's been pushed back as well. But instead of being kicked down the road, a lot of those hogs have been euthanized as piglets right now, and the estimate is close to 10 million head has been euthanized in North America. So that suddenly takes all that production out of the system. Unlike the beef sector, where you cannot euthanize the animals, at least we've got such a much longer um, cycle in terms of production. But it is significant in the sense that we're going to continue to see strong pork exports next year, which I think will be price supportive, hopefully, for beef. So. Let's talk about that additional 6.7%. Um, and it effectively is about 780,000 metric tonnes that's been pushed into next year. My figures say 762. That's the adjustment the USDA have made. But in reality, it's 780,000 tonnes that will be pushed into next year. So. Here we are. Is the can going to be cooked, um, kicked into the fourth quarter of this year, into the first and second quarter, or into the third quarter, third and fourth quarter? And in reality, I think the decisions about that it may are being made right now as we speak. So 
we're coming into the Northern Hemisphere um, summer period. Their pastures, they've had excellent rain and they have good pastures. And all the indications are that they're going to carry those 1.6 million head on, on the, sorry, on pastures a lot longer. And as a result, when that decision is made, it pretty well is committed all the way through to August, September, once that decision is made. And that, that's the point at which we'll see those animals start going into feedlots in North America. Once in feedlots, the, light, the chances are then we're going to see those same animals appear in the months of probably February, March and April. But it may come as early as January, February, March. And what we're seeing is a condensed um, amount of meat, I think, that's going to hit the market pretty dramatically during that first quarter. 780,000 tonnes to be exact. That is enough to really force the market down. And that is going to impact our beef prices. That's going to impact our lamb prices. But not just for North America, because we compete with the US into Japan, into Korea, into Indonesia, into all these major markets. And if they have cheaper meat than we do, they're going to sell it at much lower levels, which will impact the price at which we sell meat. So it's really important to understand that America really sets global beef prices and I believe global lamb prices. And by understanding that, you then get a good appreciation of just how severe this carryover of 780,000 tonnes is. Once upon a time, we've used the expression, a wall of meat. Well, that is a wall of meat that's coming. So part of the critical answer to helping solve this oversupply of US beef, but also what's important for our price of cattle, our price of meat, is how quickly can the food service rebound. And if you remember last week, we spoke of some of the key drivers and factors that are going to um, influence the price of cattle, sheep and lambs. So COVID-19 restrictions being lifted, um, therefore food service can re recover. The supply hole starts to appear in August to November. So that's those cattle that I just spoke of being taken out of the system and therefore production is delayed into next year and creates that hole in America during that August to November, December period. Once again, that impacts our global other markets because they're going to be short of meat into Japan, into Korea, and also onto their domestic market. And just to be really clear about it, and we'll see this later, we share with the US 80%, 87% of the Japanese market in beef. We share more than 90% of the Korean market in beef. So it's absolutely critical understanding when shortages are going to occur because of America, because that lifts our prices, and when oversupply is going to occur, that'll push our prices down in all those markets. The WASDA report we just spoke of with the, um, the enormous amount of um, kicking the can down the road, meat to appear, Chinese New Year, and then the bounce back effect and the IMF global growth rate versus that excess amount of meat that's going to appear in the system. We'll discuss all of those tonight. So, as we said, restrictions being lifted. We touched on this last week, and as we speak, these continue right across the world. This is 50% of the market in which food service, restaurants, casual eating, dining, bars, as we know, when they open, that will mean that 50% of the market can start to recover. And that affects, obviously, the strip loins, the tenderloins, the cube rolls, the racks of lamb that we produce. Everything sold into that market is absolutely critical. So the sooner these restrictions are lifted, the sooner the food service industry and sector can get going. 
In America, half the states have lifted to date. In Asia, as we said last week, three out of key of key of the countries, China, Vietnam and South Korea have lifted, and in part, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Singapore, the Philippines, um, Japan and India. And I apologise, I've, I've written Vietnam twice. It has actually started lifting quite a while ago. In Europe, 10 countries have lifted restrictions, four are pending and France has delayed until July the 24th. Australia, we've started lifting, even Victoria now, though it still is um, many rules to, uh, to abide by. South America, they're in all sorts of trouble if you if you keep an eye on the media. But still, 24 states are restricted. Two have started to ease them, and other South American countries have minimal COVID-19 at this point. And last but not least, the Middle East have started lifting during the period of Ramadan. So it's really important to understand that restrictions, once they lift, will drive the food service market. As we said earlier, things have started to improve in managing COVID-19 in America. So on the left, you've got the last week's beef production. It's now at 25% below um, the March levels. So what does that mean? It means now that they're killing a lot more cattle and we've started to see certain meat prices fall. Not as dramatically as, as what they could if they were back to full production, but we've seen a slight correction. And it effectively means more people are back to work in meat plants and therefore higher throughput because they can kill more animals per day. And the same holds for the pork production. It's only down 21.3% and it all is the same again in the sense that they are having higher throughput and therefore starting to get um, more uh, pork produced and therefore prices are starting to um, correct themselves. And this begs the question though, is how, you know, what is going to be the impact of COVID-19 for the balance of this year? And the belief is that they will not get back to normal at all. At best, it might be somewhere between 10 to 20% that they may get back to because of absenteeism and ongoing spot fires of COVID-19. And to me, this is critical because it's going to help drive prices this year. And the question is, what happens next year? And most believe, I did a, a poll overnight amongst processors in America, along with uh, uh, a number of end users I deal with, and each of them came back saying they expect at least two, three, four months of disruptions, but they expect next year to be back to normal. So that backlog of cattle will be killed in the first quarter of next year. So we touched on last week the bounce back act. And those states that are open in America, this bounce back effect is already happening. And I am hearing that loud and clear amongst all my customers across America today and last week on the phone. They are saying that people are out partying everywhere. So consumption is improving. And when you talk to people in the food service sector, they're saying that in particular, um, quick service restaurants bar, is almost 80% back to normal. It's the white tablecloth areas that are struggling and those restaurants, some of them are still closed. So in America, the general consensus is that around about 50% of food service is back on track, as opposed to a month, two months ago, it was almost 80 to 90% had shut down. So freezers, if you remember, were clogging up. They're now no longer clogged. Imported beef is starting to flow quickly through the system, and we've seen price rises of around 10 to 15% in the last two weeks on imported beef. Has it flowed over into lamb? Not yet. And we'll talk about why lamb is so unique and the problems it's going to be up against. So we also touched on last week the rebound effect. And that effectively is that 
IMF, um, the International Monetary Fund, is expecting next year a 5.8% growth rate for the year. This year, a negative 3%. Now, as we stated last week, this is very much dependent upon a vaccine, I believe, being found. And my concern, and this is the tug of war that we're up against, is what's going to be the impact of that oversupply on the market when so much volume comes forward of north of, of within the US cattle industry against this uh, recovery and the bounce back effect. And the two, I think, in part will negate themselves. Um, I think it lends itself to the back half of next year looking um, a lot more positive than the first half of next year. So once again, we touched on last week, and these are important because we're just about to get into the cattle forecast. But if you remember, the cattle on feed numbers in Australia are down 30%, we're expecting by June. And that's because of the, the cheap cuts that came back onto the Australian domestic market, the middle cuts, the cube rolls, the strip loins, the tenderloins, which forced down pricing here, and as a result, made it very unprofitable, particularly for grain-fed and Wagyu-type cattle, to put them on feed. So around about six to eight weeks ago, people started to destock feedlots dramatically because it was it's an unprofitable business given the, the fall in value of the food service market and the fall in value of those key middle cut items. So we're expecting by June to have 30% reduction. But we also know that we've got that pipeline that's empty and the market's starting to pick up on that. And we're going to talk about that in our feeder steer prices in the, in the next few slides. Once again, the US market, as we've touched on, we've had you know record low placements. We've got um, that uh, you know lack of meat in the system that's led to meat being pushed back into next year. But it's important to recognise that the last quarter of this year, it's going to be short of both Australian beef and US beef, grain fed that is. So the impact of kicking the can down the road, pushing that meat into next year. So when you put the value of U the US choice cut out, so that's the value of basically the carcass in America, that if you were to put all the wholesale values of that carcass together and glue it back together, that's the average value of the, of the carcass based on all the various wholesale values. So when you put that against Australian export values, so I estimate or determine that by the total value of exports that we do globally divided by the volume. And there is a strong price relationship between what Australia produces at what price against what the US cutout value is. And as I said earlier on, the US dictate global prices and Australia in particular is impacted by that. As I said, we share many, many markets. Now, there are a couple of blips and in, in, in moments in time where that relationship separates a little, and that was during the Australian drought where we had um, product that kept coming forward and we had a dramatic shortage in North America which saw rises there that we weren't able to capitalise on at the time. But those moments, as you can see since 2005, you know, don't happen very often. And by and large, we tend to move with those global, with the value of US cutout against our global export values. So if you look to the far right there, based on that dramatic, you know, amount of meat to hit the first quarter, I've got the US cutout falling and we are going to fall with it. And so that's, you know, quite a significant, as I said, volume of meat, 780,000 metric tonnes. And so the net effect is that Australia's global values that will fall in proportion to the value of what the cutout will fall. But that fall, I think, 
will be mainly felt in the first half of next year because that's when the volume is starting to appear in the US market. So how does that value or the, the fall in Australian value correlate into what else we do? Well, first of all, let's touch on what I said earlier. We share 95% of global markets with North America. In Japan alone, 87% is made up of both US and Australian beef. And in Korea, it's more than 90%. So not only are we the largest exporter um, of beef into the US, but we share all these other markets with North America. So no wonder their pricing of their cutout impacts us because we're up against it every day. Now, China also plays a critical role in the value of our meat and effectively has forced America to compete harder, in particular for our grinding meat and our round cuts. So at the, at the frozen end, the commodity end of the animal, that's where China's played a critical role in forcing America to pay up for product. And that's what we saw all through last year. I'll be brutally honest, China has not fully recovered, is showing signs of improving, but it is not the robust market that we enjoyed for most of last year. It's a slow process. And part of that is, is you know, built into our forecast tonight. So we've got opposing forces. We've got a tight female kill in Australia. And as I said earlier, it's dramatic how much that the fall in female kill has been. And as a result, um, we've also got oversupply in North America. And so the net impact, if we hadn't have had that oversupply in North America, I think we would have seen really strong prices going into next year. But as a result, it's dampened that first half of next year. And I'm on the right-hand side there, I've shown where I think it's going to drag the prices back to. So we saw in terms of export value, it could have got to a 185. In actual fact, it's likely to fall to around about a 160. So let's then correlate that into a feeder steer prices. So if you look here on the left where the orange or the, the reddish um, is, that's what the market has been. They're the actual numbers. And as you go forward, um, these are my forecasts. So originally, a month or two ago, I had the peak for February, March. But as this hole has appeared in North America, um, and pushed it back into that February, March period, the volume of meat, I've effectively brought forward the high in the market, which I see in October, November this year, sitting at around about 440 cents per kilo um, live weight for feeder steers. I was hoping and believing that over the next four or five weeks, we might have seen some of the market pull back on feeder steers effectively taking a breather, as it has done in the past. But because of those incredibly high kill figures that we saw earlier on, we just simply don't have the cattle out there. There is just not the feeders available. And as I highlighted, this year in particular, the male kill will be down. Steers will be a lot lower this year than next year. This is the year it gets really tight on feeder steers. So I've got effectively the high there in October, November of 440. That equates to an ecchi, I believe, of around 850 a kilo. That's when MLA will get it back up and running. I have for February 21 there um, falling back to just below 400 cents per kilo. And that's because of that oversupply problem in North America. But I'm of the opinion that if it wasn't for some of these other positive factors out there, that could have been a lot lower. Then as we go through next year into the back, into the last quarter, there's probably going to be another step down. And part of that is related to the rebuild and the process. And there will be 
starting to appear more cattle. As I said, next year, the, the, the male kill will be higher out of Australia, just simply because the, the herd will start rebuilding, growing and producing more. So let's look at steps that's impacted those particular points along the way. So if you look at step one down there, feedlot demand. So that hole that we're talking about in June, here we are in the middle of May, those guys are starting to realise that this, they need to start refilling because out front is starting to look okay again. So you're going to start to see, I believe, a lot stronger feedlot demand over the next six to eight weeks that's going to continue all the way through the year. So that once we thought there was going to be some breathing space, I don't think so. I think they're realising that the cattle just simply aren't out there. Point two there, you can see COVID-19 restrictions lift. So this is the period in which the food service sector can finally start to get going. And as I said, we've seen already in North America, we've gone from 80% shutdown to now 50% shutdown. And we're hoping that within the next month or two, that we might be more like a 20 to 30% shutdown. So COVID-19 restrictions lifting all over the world will start to help lift prices. Then the third is that hole, as I discussed, in the US. And that will drive demand in that August, September, October period. Then we get to Chinese New Year, number four there. And that starts around about September, October, November and builds. And I think we'll start to see that. And interestingly, though, the market will be wary of oversupplying. And I think the Chinese will be aware of overbuying because of what went on last November, December, January where they simply got out of control. And I think the market will be wary both on the buy and the sell side. So I think we're going to see a much more structured approach in, in buying this year for Chinese New Year. And surprisingly, it may start to pull up around that October, November period, which is going, going to coincide with the high there in the market that I'm pointing out. And then as we get into next year, We've got the bounce back effect that I said that we're starting to already see people out and about, but as more and more restrictions are lifted and the enormous amount of stimulus money that's in the, the currently circulating throughout the world starts to really take effect. And, and so we've got that um, growth rate that the IMF number six there at the top started to kick in as well um, with, you know, growth rates of around about 5.8% expected. So once you step through that, you start to see how those various factors that I alluded to last week play a role in the pricing of cattle. And that same structure here in front of you will be repeated for every type of animal as we step through them. So keep that visual in mind because it plays a crucial role. As I said, I think without the bounce back effect and the IMF report, you know, the 5.8% the growth rate for next year, if none of that occurred, I think we would have seen pricing for next year a lot lower. So effectively, it's kept at least, I think, two thirds of the market next year in pretty good shape. So then we're on to the heavy steer forecast. And like the feeder steers, I'm expecting, you know, that the market will peak um, probably about a month early, around about September this year. And part of the reason why it won't be in October or November or December is I think we'll start to see some heavier animals coming through, particularly out of Victoria. But with such good pasture conditions across Australia, this is one category of animal where you know people will be going pretty hard on trying to get as much weight on their animals. Keep in mind after a drought, you know, that people's uh, packets are needing to be um, serviced. So, you know, effectively, people will be wanting to put as much weight as they can on their animals. So I see the peak around about September. Um, it may be late August, but September, 
And then once the volume starts to come onto the market, it's probably going to have a dampening effect. But as I said, it looks pretty damn good for next year anyway. So I've got the average price for next year at around 342 a kilo um, against this year's average price of 345. Um, as I said, in the back end of next year, we'll start to see a little bit more supply come on. Um, and as we get closer, we will get a better understanding of how these stimulus packages have looked. And maybe, you know, as we get into the final quarter of next year, it might be even better than the numbers I've put there in front of you. But at this point in time, I see, you know, the majority of the next 18 months to be in pretty damn good shape. Dealer steers. So these are for, in particular, the people on the north coast because they are in this market every day. Um, so Casino is, is a well-known um, deal operation, does a great job. Um, so we've got here where I see, once again, a similar period of peaking around September, October. Um, I think part of this too, though, is highlights, and I've given feeder steers and vealer steers, is that feeder steers are in tight supply this year in particular. Next year, I think they'll be a little bit more available. And so you've got, due to that tightness, um, the value of vealer steers and feeder steers will, are going to be really quite similar, I think, for the next six to eight months. But as we get more into next year, that premium that normally exists for vealer steers should reappear in the market. Um, so November, I've got the peak at 4.58 a kilo. Um, and I've got next year's average overall would you believe sitting at 403 a kilo, slightly higher than this year's? So that's uh, probably due to, um, as I said, um, a bit of a slow start at the start, but also a good portion of next year where the market looks to be, I think, in reasonably good shape. And then we're on to cows. So this year, sorry, next year is a very tight year on cows and as I said my only real concern is that first quarter of next year and the cow market is driven really by North America and by China and I think that we'll see some incredibly good demand from now until probably October November this year for cows and that's driven by as we said earlier the um, the desire for North America with prices going considerably higher. Um, we've been trading in real up money in the last uh, two to three weeks. But on top of that, I think we'll start to see um, China step back into the market and start to keep pace with North America. So once again, we'll start to see them fighting over um, the lean end of the market, which is really what China wants. Um, and that as a result, should see some pretty good prices as we move into the October-November period. So I've got the peak there sitting at around 344 cents a kilo. Um, and next year, the average I've got is around 252 versus this year's average about 285. So that increased production next year will have an impact, um, but I don't see it as do or die. Um, it's very manageable, but I show there in that box that um, our improvement in prices is dramatic since uh, 2019, with this year's prices up 44% on last year, and next year is going to be up 27%. Once again, it's those driving factors that I said earlier, where the hole's going to appear in the market, where you've got, you know, effectively a herd that's... Uh, um, been liquidating long too much too long. We've lost too many females, and we're going to have the restockers. We're going to have um, the rebuilders out there um, and uh, breeders. Everyone fighting over what effectively is a very small pool of cattle. So on to sheep meat markets. So just to go over some of the key things, the quick market update, to look at what the drought impact has been, 
the movement, as we said last week, between um, the uh, the west to the east, the impact on flock production, slaughter, live sheep exports, they all impact the price of um, of sheep and lamb. So today's lamb prices, it's difficult given that we don't have, um, you know, due to COVID-19 and the uh, MLA's restriction on getting access to data. But it, our best guess is that we're sitting at the moment around about 8.28 cents per kilo um, on lambs and we're sitting on uh, on mutton at around 6.83 a kilo from the high that we saw back in March the 12th of 9.60 on lambs and 7.44. So we've had a 14% fall on lambs to date and only about a 9% fall on mutton so far. So we alluded to this last week, but it's important to just reiterate that um, conditions in the West continue to be um, dry. Groundwater continues to be the real concern in, um, in Southwest um, Western Australia. And we've had six, 726,000 head of livestock move east in the last four months as a result. That's seen close to 384,000 lambs come across and 312,000 head of sheep and just over 30,500 head of cattle. So you can see March was the most significant month there um, with almost 300,000 in that month alone. So it's been dramatic. The sheep slaughter, I've just done a quick comparison with some of the other previous droughts. And given the size of our flock has reduced dramatically, the sheep slaughter um, is in line with what previous droughts have been like. But I think we've been killing um, our sheep at a rate of knots that is of an equivalent to what we've been killing our cattle at in terms of proportionately. So. The net effect is that I believe we've got a sheep flock size of close to 58 and a half million head, which is, um, you know, I think one of the lowest flock sizes um, in, in about 120 years or so. It's incredibly low. And this is where I show how the, since about 2010, both the flock and the herd size have moved in tandem proportionately with each other. But with two good years under our belt this year and next with the, both the rebuild and in both the flock and the herd, my expectation is um, by about 2024, we're going to see a flock close to 71 million head. And we're going to see a herd close to 29 million head. Um, so we're I think in for a rigorous rebuild process, which in part explains for the lack of uh, females in the system. So Australia's slaughter and production estimates, um, we touched on these last week, we won't spend too much on them, but I've got um, the lamb slaughter down 9.2% this year, down to 19.8 million, it's very low, and you've got the, um, the sheep, um, production estimate dramatically down by 34%. Um, so that's just going to lend itself to some pretty tight numbers making available for production. Our key export markets in lamb, we've got um, the US and China pretty well dominating the lamb exports. And last year, China was um, took the bulk, or that was the largest market, with just over 71,000 metric tons, and America took just over 50, 58,500 tons. So when you just isolate those two this year so far, January to April, um, China is a smidge in front of um, North America in terms of volume on the right-hand side there. So it's a very competitive environment between North America, um, the US, and China when it comes to land. So what's the importance of global beef price to lamb? And so I believe that, um, you know, given, I guess, the enormity, so there's about 70 million tonnes a year produced of beef and about 15 million tonnes worth of sheep meat produced a year. 
And so you might say the tail doesn't wag the dog. And lamb in particular is a high-end product. And so what I've done here is I've looked at um, the value of global beef, in particular US and Australian, because we exist in the top end of the market in terms of beef, and I've put lamb against it. And effectively you can see heavy lamb in particular, and I've converted them both into US dollars. And you can see where the value of lamb at times follows very closely the, the value of global beef. And so when you've got those periods of high priced lamb occurring and periods where lamb prices fall, they're the periods of oversupply and undersupply of lamb in the Australian and New Zealand markets. So effectively, when you slice through the middle the global beef value, and you put the lamb production through there, which is the blue, and you put the heavy lamb value through there, which is the orange, you can see that as production falls, as it did in 2010-11, you get a dramatic pickup in the value of, of lamb sitting well above beef. And so when um, lamb production is above um, expectation, then lamb values fall below the global value of beef. But it's the high end. I'm talking about grain-fed beef, and lamb exists, I believe, in that top end of the market. It's quite unique in that sense. So in my mind, once you understand what global beef values are doing, it gives us a really good guide on what lamb values are going to do, and effectively show us, if, if you can understand what supply is going to do on lamb, you understand what global beef is going to do on lamb, then, uh, sorry, on beef, then it gives us, a, I think, a strong indication of where lamb values are going to be. So, as you can see on the right here, I have put um, into the um, equation the falling value of the cutout and also the falling value of global beef prices, which I think effectively is going to drag down, unfortunately, lamb values. Um, you know, heavy lamb values next year. So here's my heavy lamb forecast. I've got the high in July this year of 900 cents per kilo, which is no, nowhere near kind of the dizzy numbers that we saw last year. And I've got the low next year in March of around about 720. And that is because of that impact of global beef prices falling dramatically in that first quarter due to oversupply out of North America. That will drag the value down of lamb in that period. And I've got next year um, uh, another high at around about 880 a kilo in July. Now that may come in August, it's, it's often hard to predict. So the biggest concern and why our pricing on lamb is, is unfortunately not as good as it could be because given the shortness of supply of lamb in Australia, these levels should be much, much higher than what they are. And the reason is, is because the food service sector is struggling, as we've said. But in particular, when you look at what goes to North America of lamb and sold into the food service sector, Roughly around about 50% goes into retail, 50% goes into the food service. But in terms of value, it's about 70% of the value is in the food service. It's the high end that's so critical. And in that food service, it's dominated by the cruise line industry. And so this may or may not be a well-known fact, but almost 50% of the needs of America's food service market ends up in the cruise line industry when it comes to lamb. And there are two particular items that, that dominate that cruise line, and that's lamb racks and lamb shanks. And so when the cruise line industry gets back up running, we'll see the full value being reflected in pricing of what lamb's really worth. But right now, the brakes are being put on because 
the cruise line industry is shut globally because of COVID-19. And unless that industry gets itself up and running, it's going to be a drag on the value of land. So when you then look at the retail side of things, that's dominated by legs, shoulders, and a minimal amount of racks. But it's hard to put any more into that system. So unfortunately, the lamb sector is beholden to food service, and in particular, at this point in time, to the cruise line industries, which is so critical in basically ensuring that lamb racks demand is is sustainable and is kept up. We also know that you know China plays a critical role in lamb as well. The figures have shown us. But if you break it up, it's North America that tends to take the higher value items of lamb, and and China takes the lower value. So we really need that high value food service item really working in North America for land values to regain what I think is their true worth. So heavy land forecast, as I said, $9 in July, $7.20 the low. That's driven because of that oversupply problem in North America, and then rebounding to $8.80. Now, in the meantime, if, if we should get a rebound in, uh, in terms of the cruise line industry, and other food service outlets in North America, and more racks are sold, then I'm happy to readjust that number and hoping that we're going to head back above a thousand cents a kilo again. But right now, that's the reason why the brakes are on. So mutton markets, they're key here. The two major ones, well, China is pretty well it. You know, it's driving the bus here. Um, and we've seen those exports so far for the first um, January to April this year, um, not as dramatic as it was last year, and I think part of that is just simply supply is tight. So it's difficult when when you know we've killed so many so much of the flock that you just got a a supply and demand issue, and China is is in terms of pricing is. Um, is at times looking for value, you might say. So exports are slightly down. Here are my mutton forecasts. I've got the peak coming in July, August, in, in August, September, sitting at around 765 this year. Um, I've got a low in, in April next year of around 600 cents per kilo, and then back up to 755 a kilo in August next year. So I, I see demand for mutton continuing to be in relatively good shape um, with a mild um, decline there. And part of that could be just simply because we're hopefully going to get um, the flock starting to respond and rebuild over the next 12 months with slightly more animals coming forward. But effectively, I see the mutton market in relatively good shape um, for the next 18 months and simply demand to hold together to remain fairly good, as we've pointed out, with all those driving factors and supply to be tight. And that effectively is going to ensure that mutton remains, I think, in, um, in pretty good shape. So now we're on to goat meat exports. And dare I say, we're getting quite close to the end of our presentation. Um, so goat meat exports, once again, the US dominates this market. Um, we shipped in 2019 just over 14,000 metric tons into North America, up slightly on the previous year. Our other markets tend to pale into insignificance. Taiwan, Canada, Trinidad, and South Korea, all well below 2,000 tons compared to, uh, to North America. And then we look at live goat exports. I only throw this up because I think it reflects part of the, the problem that you know, I'm, I'm a strong believer that, you know, the goat market is really driven by feral goats in Australia. And the majority of those goats, if my memory serves me right, around about 50% um, with um, uh, coming out of New South Wales. Um, and effectively, the, the drought 
has driven those goats in terms of, I mean, we've seen liquidation, but deaths of goats out in the paddocks would have been dramatic during the, how bad the drought got. So I'm expecting goat supply to be tight for this year, and, and as the pastures improve, they'll, the goat numbers will pick up, obviously. But in a way, these live goat exports show, I think, a deterioration in those numbers since 2018 and 19, with the numbers down dramatically. We did keep up, you know, shipping them in a box form, um, but probably the main reason there is that the uh, ability to buy and the return on the box form was probably better than on the live form. But effectively, there was a lot less goats in the system um, over the last two years, probably due to the drought. So. What are my forecasts on goats? Well, the market in North America for goats is really um, uh, a halal market, and it's really supply driven. And the lack of supply means that goat prices remain pretty damn healthy. And what tends to happen is that a lot of the goat um, meat is actually cubed um, for the customer base. And so, at times, there is some substitution going on between goat and mutton. Um, and on the whole, though, um, the goat market, due to lack of supply out of Australia, and there are very few other suppliers into North America of goat meat around the world. We pretty well dominate that market. So my expectation, due to the severity of the drought, is that goat prices will remain high for the balance of this year with uh, August pretty well being the high in the market. Um, and I think that's more due to seasonal factors in North America at the tail end of their summer. And then next year, to have a correction in goats, goat pricing, simply because the availability as the pasture improved, the conditions improved right across New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland, I expect the supply to come forward and therefore prices to be corrected in accordance. So here's my little uh, snapshot of the goat world. So with all that said, um, I'd like to thank you for joining me this evening, um, and we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Uh, yeah, as we are running a little bit over time, um, we've got already questions for you. Uh, one in particular, Simon, just I think you've answered it, but just get a, a bit of re-confirmation. Um, Does the fact there'll be a potential supply shortage of female cattle in 2021 mean that there's an opportunity to potentially purchase young heifers now in the current market with reasonable confidence that cow value is going to hold up in 2021 despite the current high outlay for a heifer? Question. Um, a, a very uh, um, good assumption, and um, and I would be um, saying that anything that's a, a female at the moment is going to be valuable next year and in the back half of this year. And a, a little bit of a, where do you see the peak um, market for grown heifers? Yes. Grown heifers. Um, well, once again, it's likely to peak probably around that period of September, October this year, um, for all the same reasons that overall global demand will be probably at its peak, as well as um, you know the, the rebuild itself um, and restockers. Everyone will be in their boots and all. So, um, as I've highlighted in across a number of those categories. Um, you know, September, October, November this year is probably the peak um, for those animals. Uh, Simon, there's a question here. Um, today, Trump, in his ag address, um, was saying he will potentially stop beef imports into the US, even with trade agreements. Is he referring to Australia or more? more so from South America, knowing they will have a potential excess coming forward into the system. 
Yeah, look, I, I, um, I, I can't answer that question only because um, I believe when Donald Trump makes some of those points that they're not particularly well um, uh, researched. So right now they have a very strong reliance on lean beef um, and that's obvious by the prices that they're paying. We're seeing at the moment um, FOB, lean beef, uh, 90s trading at around about 255 to 260 and, and a month ago they were trading probably closer to 225, 230. So that, the, the market's telling you something already that they need the meat. And um, you know, with a lot of the, um, the production going into the first quarter of next year, there is going to be deficiencies within the US system, not just for um, commodity type items, but I think a great opportunity exists for um, the quality end of the market during the months of September, October, November, and hopefully well into next year as well. Um, but as we spoke about last week, one of the ironies could well be is you know that American meat could end up going into China, and Australian beef high end, chilled, grain fed, could end up going into North America, and both come both individuals doing that will be making money hopefully. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, also, a question here um, with, I believe they're alluding to, with Brazilian um, currency down and Argentina down 75%, are there any concerns they will undercut us even further with prices in China and subsequently hold our prices down? It's, it's an ongoing concern, obviously. What's clear though is that Brazil um, has been killing a high number of females themselves over the last two years. So effectively, Brazil has been liquidating their own herd. So I'm not expecting Brazil to suddenly you know, produce a hell of a lot more meat over the next two to three years on the fact that they have killed so many females. And why is that? Is because China, is in the market for lean meat. And Brazil, Argentina have been producing a lot. And the farmers in those countries, in particular Brazil, with such a low currency, decided to take the money and run, meaning that their economy is terrible in Brazil. And so these farmers were cashing in because they knew that it wouldn't last forever and that they were far better off selling their females now at the higher money than hoping and waiting till this year or whatever. And in hindsight, it proved to be the right decision given the price corrections we saw in China over December, January and into February, which we still haven't recovered from. So to answer your question, I don't see Brazil as a threat. Um, I believe Argentina the exports have actually slowed right down because of COVID-19 problems. Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, there's room for all of us in China, given the enormous deficit of African swine fever. Yeah, thanks, Simon. And probably one more quick question. Um, and I think you've also almost covered it in previous slides. Um, where do you believe the peak for trade lambs will be? One more. Um, but it will be coinciding with a lot of those other peaks. And these, we'll be making these slides available um, for um, people to look at. Um, uh, but as I, I'm going to quickly fly back through and just highlight where. The, um, but I think we can say, you know, that we'll see this year, probably in July, August, um, the peak in that market, and and once again next year. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm an old pass over to Max now, and he'll wrap things up for us all this evening. Yeah.
Thanks, Nathan. And thank you, Simon, for sharing your knowledge with us this evening. I know we can't cover all the questions due to time constraints, but we've tried to bring you a good cross-section of the questions being asked. Simon, would you like to take us through again where people can follow you for your forecasting? I'd like to just add, um, Nathan, um, that I'd encourage people this evening to send questions in. Um, we probably, what we'll do is look to answer all the questions that are outstanding. And we're going to record a separate um, webinar or, or video um, of the answers to those questions. So I'd encourage you, it'll be a pre-recording, and that then will be sent out to all the listeners. So if the volume of questions are enough to justify it, we'll, um, we'll put together a pre-recording of the answers to those questions. Um, and either Max or Nathan, I'm hoping, will help me to do that. So um, that's already been discussed um, before today's webinar, and um, and the uh, and Brent was quite happy to do so. So I would encourage you to please send in more questions. Um, I write every week um, two or three articles, put out webinars and podcasts regularly under Global AgriTrend subscription. Um, feel free to send me an email or contact me. Um, and uh, what you've heard tonight is what I do on a regular basis. So with, uh, without any further ado, I um, better also put up my disclaimer for good order's sake. Um, but I'd just like once again to thank everyone for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Simon. And I'm sure a lot of people will be following you. Yeah, and we look forward to getting you on the Productive Producer podcast series in the near future.